Welcome back to Topics in American Literature, the American Mixtape with Mr. Smith at Tennessee Tech Spring 2022 semester. It's March 28th, and I'm going to teach on one of my favorite topics that uh, mixes my career as a DJ, um, uh, my life as a spiritual seeker, and my professional training at Vanderbilt Divinity School as an academic theologian. And, and this is related to my final master's degree thesis project, um, Banjo and Bread, which tells the story of hippie Christianity based here in Cookville, Tennessee in the late 1960s and early 70s. I was born, as you all remember me telling you, in 1967, and I was raised up. Uh, this is the kind of this is the kind of church I was raised up in. I was raised up in mainline Protestantism, but I was also raised up in uh, in the hippie church. So uh, today's talk is called uh, God Means Revolution, Counterculture Christians and the Hippie Jesus Mixtape. I've given uh, this talk in many formats uh, over the years, um, and I'm going to be speaking mostly from uh, my rootedness uh, in this topic uh, than from a manuscript, right? So um, I'm a bit freestyle. As we as we as we learned last night on television, uh, going off book and going freestyle can sometimes have some bad uh, consequences. So I welcome your your comments uh, and clarifications at, in the chat at the at the end of the talk, and hopefully I'll leave plenty of time uh, for that. But I, I realize that we're also getting a late, little bit of a late start after those videos. But I hope you guys enjoyed uh, the videos from Jesus Christ Superstar and Hair. I'm sorry, and Godspell. Uh, Hair is the third in the trilogy. We're not looking at that today, but the trilogy, my my rock musical trilogy of my early childhood, was Hair. Uh, Godspell and Jesus Christ Superstar. And we looked at uh, Godspell and Jesus Christ Superstar. Um, the roots of my hippie Christianity is in a movement called the Catholic Workers. The Catholic Workers uh, were started by these two people, Dorothy Day and Peter Morin, um, because they had come out of the Great Depression when there was a lot of poverty. And there was a lot of socialism and communism that was addressing uh, the topic of poverty in uh, the United States. And this was uh, a time when there was a lot of people who wanted to see the U US be less free market and less uh, uh, capitalistic. And uh, and Dorothy Day came out of that movement, but she had a conversion to Jesus as a young woman after having had a child out, out of wedlock and doing all kinds of crazy stuff. She lived a fairly bohemian uh, New York lifestyle. And she met this, uh, I think, a French guy uh, called uh, Peter Morin and, and, and they decided, why should we leave it to the communists to feed the hungry? And uh, and so um, so they went for it and they uh, started a movement uh, called the Catholic Workers, where they gave food away to hungry people and they started a hospitality houses all over the United States. And they decided that the reason why we didn't have enough food for the hungry is because we were too preoccupied with war. Um, a theme I think is still re very relevant in our world uh, today. And so they, they devoted their time to campaigning for the end of war. And particularly they were concerned in the later days of the Catholic worker movement and post 1945, uh, post World War II, post Hiroshima and Nagasaki against the proliferation of, uh, of nuclear weapons. And so they, they, they protested and they, uh, and they campaigned um, against war, but they did it from a Jesus uh, perspective and they saw a social revolution rooted in the New Testament teachings of Jesus the Nazarene. And so uh, uh, Dorothy Day, uh, very provocative, um, said once in um, uh, toward the end of her career um, uh, that uh, we need to change the system. Now, if you've been to church, and I know some folks on the, just from what you've written and, and talked about in some of your, your stuff, are, are, are churchy kind of folk, you may have heard, heard a, a, a theologian or a minister or a teacher speak about the world and talking about um, being, you know, a part of the kingdom or the beloved community as being opposed to, quote unquote, uh, the world. Well, there's a whole line of, uh, theologians that have talked about the system or the domination system as what you you all might call uh, the world. And this th this would be a um, a connection, right, uh, uh, to that. So she said, we need to change the system. We need to overthrow not the government, as the authorities always accuse the communists of conspiring to do, but we need to get rid of this rotten, decadent, putrid system which breeds suffering. And so she believed that that we we were living with kind of institutional problems uh, related 
uh, uh, to um, racism, I'm sorry, to uh, uh, economic, uh, by the way, the Catholic workers would have been against racism, but they, they were concerned about, about the system or the world uh, dealing with poverty because there were so few rich people who had so much money and so many poor people who had so little money. And this is still a problem uh, that we see uh, in the world today. And then Peter Morin, he wrote these things called easy essays. And they were just like these little like, um, you know, uh, poetry uh, uh, rants uh, that he would he would make. And uh, and he would he would put them out there. Um, uh, and, and, and people would read them uh, and people uh, uh, cared for his uh, words. He said things like the world would be better off if people tried to become better. And people would become better if they stopped trying to become better off. For when everybody tries to become better off, nobody is better off. But when everybody tries to become better, everybody is better off. Every would be, everybody would be rich if nobody tried to be richer. And nobody would be poor if everybody tried to be the poorest. And everybody would be what they ought to be if everybody tried to be what they want the other fellow to be. Christianity has nothing to do with either modern capitalism or modern communism. For Christianity has a capitalism of its own and a communism of its own. And uh, uh, he says uh, uh, that uh, there are three ways to make a living, stealing, begging, and working. Stealing is against the law of God and against the law of men. Begging is against the law of men, but not against the law of God. Working is neither against the law of God nor against the law of men. But they say that there is no work to do, and there is plenty of work to do, but no wages. But people do not need to work for wages, for they can offer their services as a gift. This idea that we should just give everything away to everybody is so foreign, you know, to our society. But spiritual teachers, uh, including Jesus, but uh, in other traditions as, as well, spoke this since since time immemorial. Um, in the in the Beat Generation movement, now we just had a, a small snippet of the Beat Generation, and I connected them to Bob Dylan and the Grateful Dead, early 60s, late 50s. Um, there was this guy who was a Catholic monk, uh, William Everson, also known as Brother Antoninus, and he would wear his monk's robes, and he would go to these like beatnik coffee houses and give poetry readings. And I discovered him years ago when I was teaching about Jack Kerouac, and one of my students very honestly said, she said, I think the beatniks are kind of cool, but I wish they were Christians. And I said, I'm sure there were Christian beatniks. And so I went and looked it up. And of course, I realized that then I was a Christian beatnik too, you know? So, so I wrote a whole book about that called Beat is Beatitude. It came out about 2014 uh, uh, about being a Jesus beatnik. And uh, so uh, Brother Antoninus, so these are some of the, the streams feeding what I'm going to talk about, um, about the late 60s and early 70s and the, the so-called Jesus people. Um, Thomas Merton, probably my favorite. And uh, um, he, uh, look, look at him there wearing his monk's robes and a trucker cap and drinking a beer. Yes, there's a Catholic monk from Kentucky. You can go to where he, he's dead. He's been dead a long time, sadly, more, more than 50 years. But you can go where he uh, is buried at the monastery at Gethsemane, Kentucky, Trappist, Kentucky. It's in, right in the middle of bourbon country. And he was an incredibly prolific writer and author um, who taught so many people about God and about peace and about the, the spiritual journey and interfaith. He did a lot of interfaith work with peace, people of, of a Buddhist uh, disposition. Uh, Seven Story Mountain, still one of the best-selling Christian autobiographies of all time about him being a, a bohemian, much like Dorothy Day, being a bohemian in New York City and having a, a radical conversion uh, uh, to God. So uh, uh, his, his poetry and writing today is very important to me because I've been reading his writings this week about peace um, as we look at the war uh, escalating in the Ukraine and the United States getting more involved with, uh, of course, the military aid uh, that's being provided to the Ukrainians. Um, out in California, uh, they had the Submarine Church and the, and the uh, Berkeley Free Church. And I found out that some pals of, of my parents from up in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, were actually friends uh, with the Submarine Church. And this is a, a line they stole from the, uh, the Beatles song, We All Live in a, in, a, in a Yellow Submarine. And you can see in the slide, there's a little there's a little fish. It's a submarine, but it's also supposed to be the Ichthus, the Christian fish. And then it's got a peace sign and it's got flowers uh, coming out the top. And then it's got um, uh, uh, the cross and it, and it says oikomene, which means ecumenical. And this is the, the Free Church of, uh, of Berkeley. Um, and there is uh, their pastor, the father Richard York, uh, a cartoon of the pastor there. 
in the cartoon and then over at the logo and then over at the other side that's actually a picture of them and they used to have these radical street parades and they would do these radical liturgies and so they wrote liturgies liturgy is just you know the style of worship that you use if you ever went to a catholic church or to an episcopalian church you would have experienced uh uh, liturgy. This is where uh, people uh, uh, say their prayers out of a out of a book, and so York wrote an actually like a whole um, a whole prayer book. And the title of today's talk, uh, "God Means Revolution," I took from one of his prayers, um, and this is in his book called "The Covenant of Peace: um, A Liberation Prayer Book." And uh, it goes like this: God is not dead; God is bread. The bread is rising. Bread means revolution. God means revolution. Murder is no revolution. Revolution is love. Win with love. The radical Jesus is winning. The world is coming to a beginning. The whole world is watching. Organize for a new world. Wash off your brother's blood. Burn out the mark of the beast. Join the freedom meal. Plant the people's park. The asphalt church is marching. The guerrilla church is recruiting. The people's church is striking. The submarine church is surfacing. The war is over. The war is over. The war is over. The liberated zone is at hand. The Liberation Prayer Book from the Covenant of Peace by Richard York from the early 1970s in Berkeley, California, near San Francisco. Um, there was a fork in the road. As you guys know what a fork in the road is, when you come to a place in a road and there's a, you can go this way or you can go that way. Uh, during uh, the Jesus People movement, which was a huge movement in uh, the early 70s of people who looked like hippies but talked about Jesus, there was a, a group that went right and a group that went left. And a lot of uh, conservative Christianity today comes from the Jesus People. It descends directly from uh, uh, their movement. And then some people took a left term and, 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 and the culture war writ large in America that you see today could be in its microcosm inside, inside the American church between conservative and progressive Christians. And uh, Lonnie Frisbee is an interesting case because he was a part of the conservative movement, the conservative evangelical movement. But it turns out he was a closeted homosexual who continued to live his gay life in secret all the time that he was this considered to be this prophet of the conservative evangelical church. Um, but uh, Lonnie Frisbee had been a part of the 60s uh, drug counterculture and had a very profound um, uh, LSD experience where he met Jesus in while he was high and converted to Christianity and he was going around and he was in the in the Pentecostal and charismatic scene and he was kind of going around doing healings and anointings and and speaking truth and people fell in love with his evangelism style and he was embraced by the uh, conservative evangelical scene of the early early 70s as a prophet and then of course later they disavowed him because of his homosexuality there's a very interesting uh, documentary um, that I've, I've seen made about about him I believe he died of HIV um, related uh, illness in in the in the night in the 90s or the zeros. I think he died, passed away in the 90s. But there's some great footage of him on YouTube uh, preaching, and you can watch clips of his documentary. And there's great there's uh, so that scene I, I showed at the beginning of the people getting baptized in uh, the park in New York, where there's like a fountain. They would go um, the Jesus hippies would go to the beaches in California. It was very big in California, and they would have these mass baptisms. And they would have just kid after kid after kid going into the Pacific Ocean, getting dumped one after the other after the other. Uh, and they played amazing folk music. So like today's Christian contemporary music really comes out of that of that Jesus hippie movement. Um, the fact that Jesus is a clown in uh, Godspell is very, very important. Uh, the idea of the holy fool, uh, you see it from the Apostle Paul. Uh, he says, be a fool from Christ. But it also brings in uh, mythopoetic um, memes from other traditions, this idea of the tr of the trickster or the jester or even the joker card in uh, the deck of cards. Maybe you see the joker movie, um, you know, movies uh, that have come out over the last uh, several years. And so this idea of Christ as a jester, Christ as a prankster, Christ as as making fun of Babylon, basically, of the of the worldly ways of the system and offering an alternative reality that is rooted in joy and laughter, not in, in cynicism. Uh, and sometimes people and I'm, I'm so uh, you know, from alcohol, but that that's about the only part about me that's dry. You know what I'm saying? Like we're um, 
you know, we're, we're not um, a sour and dour a lot. People who are spiritually um, seeking tend to be a very joyful group of people. They tend to, to emanate rainbows and unicorns and sunshine and, and flowers. They don't tend to be like gl glum and dour, negative Nancy's and, you know, Debbie Downers all the time. Because, because to be honest with you, uh, uh, class, if, you, if your life at any point was terrible and then all of a sudden it got good and that that freedom that liberation that that um breaking out of the chains of bondage whether those bondage be an actual prison or is it was in my case the prison of addiction you you experience a new freedom and if that freedom has a spiritual aspect to it you're going to have gratitude uh to the one who who opened up the prison door right and uh and at least in, in my case you know when i was on drugs it was it was it was jesus that that spoke to me and pulled me out of that, out of that dire uh, situation. Um, uh, the, the, to, to be a young college student in the late sixties and early seventies, uh, when all of this kind of hippie flower children thing was sweeping the nation. And then to be able to go and experience that at church, just imagine what that would have been like uh, for those kids. And so I, you know, see, uh, this is uh, JC in the uh, superstar movie. I see this uh, embodied dancing, singing thing as being very liberating. Now, it had a counterculture vibe to uh, to it at the time, but now any um, big con conservative church you go to, they you know they've got a you know they've got a praise band, and and so they they cut off from the. Um, from the kind of the anti-war movement and the peace movement and the civil rights movement, and they they embraced the conservative evangelical movement. And in my in my essay, that they, they I explain this this fork in the road, the left and, and and the right turn. And so I was not getting a lot of evidence, a lot of the scholarly evidence of of the Jesus people today. Like where are they at fifty years later? Was that they were in conservative uh, uh, churches, and I have no problem if that's your if that's your tradition. I'm not by any way. Please don't misunderstand me as um, you know uh, criticizing that. But no one had adequately. I mean, I would have criticisms theologically. We could debate that, or morally, or sociopolitically. But I'm not criticizing anyone as an in individual uh, for their lineage. We we are in the in the river that we are swimming in. And so, in my project, I was like, well, what? Where are all the people who stayed in the kind of the and I, and left right is a poor rubric. You guys know that that you know. Um, that poor man uh, <laughs> that got slapped last night. He had said one of his in his one of his routines years ago, "I'm conservative about some things. I'm liberal about some things." You know, we don't have to put everything in a bucket or a box, do we, class? So I I went and I found some real living hippie Christians who were there. You know, I was just a baby in arms. They were and a toddler. They were there. They lived it. And they were from Cookville. I like, I couldn't believe it. They went to tech for two degrees, a bachelor and a master's. I mean, I literally couldn't believe that these folks were real. And they're my dear, dear friends and mentors. And they love the things that I love. They love liturgy. They love music. They love God, but they are also social justice activists. So I wrote my paper on art, music, liturgy, and the hippie Christian counterculture of Cookville in 1964 to 1971 through uh, an oral history with Calvin and Nelia Kimbrough of, uh, of Cookville. Uh, uh, Tennessee. Um, these are some pictures of Calvin. And so Calvin showed up at Tech in, uh, in the early, in the mid 60s with his banjo uh, on his knee. I went to Cookville, Tennessee with a banjo on my knee. He was inspired by Pete Seeger, uh, the great American folk singer. He's inspired by the civil rights movement. He, uh, in high school, witnessed uh, the sit-ins happening in Nashville uh, to desegregate the lunch counters. Um, and they started uh, going uh, to hear these lectures. Uh, they went to Lake Junaluska. I don't know if I have any, any United Methodists um, in the house, but they, they made their home at the Wesley Foundation on Ninth, on Ninth Street, right across from College Side Church of Christ. You guys could, some of you are probably in walking distance from the Wesley Foundation right now. Some of you could be there in like two seconds. Um, and so uh, they uh, would go with the Wesley youth to Lake Junaluska, and they would hear um, people singing and dancing, and they would... Um, you know, read stories, they would read theology, they would read uh, literature. Um, uh, Calvin told the story of one, uh, one time they had to read a Flannery O'Connor story. And in the Flannery O'Connor story, all these people are, are going to heaven and it's all, the, it's all the misfits. 
um, and this older person is shocked when they're, and, and you've seen those pictures of people kind of riding an escalate, you know, riding a cloudy, glistening escalator to heaven. So they're on this kind of, you know, stairway to heaven. Uh, I think Led Zeppelin had a song called that. And um, and she said it was all the it was all the white trash. And she used the N word. Flannery O'Connor did. It was the white trash and the black people and the poor people and the and the and, you know the addicts and the junkies. And they got to go in first. And the good people had to wait till later, you know, the church, the church people had to wait, had to wait their turn. And he, he remembered reading that story by Flannery O'Connor and having his worldview change. He remembered, uh, you know, going to hear the speaker that he, he adored and cared about. And before this guy uh, started singing, uh, started speaking theology and teaching religion, he, he, he got them all singing uh, the Amen chorus together. Amen. Amen. Um, and, and it's just, uh, it, it became uh, an all-encompassing radical part of, uh, of uh, uh, their lives. Um, this is him up on the mountain uh, near um, uh, Beersheba Springs. Um, and there's a Methodist camp up there. It's about an hour or so uh, south of here giving a, a, a wedding service, playing guitar at a wedding service. There's a flyer for one of their uh, coffee houses in the, in the Wesley Foundation that's done Peter Max uh, style. Calvin, uh, you know, showed me these old leaflets of their order of worship. And they were, uh, you know, they were protesting uh, the war in Vietnam and they were talking about Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination. And uh, and they were bringing in, uh, you know, Bob Dylan and uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, the Beat Generation poet. They were completely integrating uh, their hippiness into church stuff in amazing and brilliant ways. And uh, they used to have their first, you know, you know, you know, churches that are big, they have the early service. Yeah. Do y'all know what is it? I'm not getting any, any comments up in here. So I don't know if y'all tracking with me or not. Y'all know like, so like there's like the nine o'clock service and then there's like the 11 o'clock, you know, like the early service. So the, the Wesley foundation would have their early service at midnight on Saturday night, all through this time period. So if you were a college student in Cookville, you could go to midnight church on Sunday morning at midnight, like the second it was the Lord's day, you know, you could get up in there and, and this man would be playing guitar and folk songs and stuff. And, they, and he made slideshows. I mean, it was like a hippie happening thing, like a real hippie happening thing at uh, the Wesley uh uh, foundation and then of course you know they're falling mad they're falling madly in love apparently in the picture on the far right there she's made all you know made most of their uh, their clothing you know and they're eating meals together they're uh they're, they're they're embodying the entire uh counterculture and they went on and their entire career after this was uh living in intentional community they formed one in indiana called patchwork central uh where they served the poor they lived for many years where i once served at the open door community in atlanta georgia serving uh the the, the those who are in poverty or in prison they're now retired they live in nashville tennessee um and so um it was through this uh project i got introduced to them actually by mutual friends there in um in atlanta and uh and we'd been corresponding. And I remember Calvin sent me this postcard once before we met. He said, I noticed that your address is uh, on, on Dixie Avenue in Cookville, Tennessee. I used to live in the campus neighborhood, y'all. I used to live a block from campus uh, there at 13th and Dixie. I live a little bit further out on the west side now. Uh, and uh, he said, I noticed your address. I used to live on that street when I was uh, a student at Tennessee Tech university so um i remember the day i met them and i couldn't believe it i was like i, I couldn't believe they were real like it was like uh god had sent me like you know aliens from another planet you know uh for, on a mission you know to, to, to show me the way it really was and that all this happened in cookville right uh, you guys might have heard about professor birdie passed away a few days ago um, I went to Bertie I, and, and I asked Bertie about this and Bertie's like, there was never any hippies in Cookville. I'm from here. There was never a hippie in Cookville. There was a whole hippie dippy scene happening in Cookville at Tennessee Tech at the Wesley Foundation. And it was all about music and love and justice. And it was also about Jesus. It was it was unbelievable. And so, um, you know, they responded by song uh, to the um, to the war in Vietnam, to the massacre of four students at Kent State Ohio University in, in May of 1970. They had a worship in response to this. They wore 
uh, black armbands around campus. They even had a, a peace vigil, you know, on the quad drangle here. And of course, as, they, as you would describe it, you know, kind of like the, re the rednecks came and gawked at them, but they had a candlelight peace vigil on the quad uh, attack against the, Viet against the Vietnam War. Um, I really want to thank you all for coming to my talk <laughs> this morning. It's my last uh, lecture um, at, at, at this semester. You guys have been an amazing class. You guys have a lot of work to do in the, in the coming uh, days to uh, finish up your assignments, and I will be on tap uh, to help you uh, with all of them as we, um, as we get through this. And um, I really appreciate you guys learning.